knowledge, used 172 times in 169 verses of the Bible. The art of defeating ignorance and gaining knowledge, both divine and natural. God's gatherings are important because we can do together what we cannot do separately and apart. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. I am so delighted you decided to join us today here on the Quick Study Television program as we take you through the Bible in one year. It is exciting and it is an interesting journey. We're in the time of the Kings, and today as we focus on 1 Kings, our reading assignment, verses 8 through 9, we're going to be focusing specifically on chapter 8, where we're going to be teaching on powering up the temple. There is power in the agreement of God's people. So we'll talk about that in just a moment, but Corey is also here with Bible Archaeology. Corey? We are taking a look at the remains of three cities that Solomon fortified and a seaport that he built. Very interesting. It might have something to do down there by never mind, by Ezra Gieber. But anyway, uh, all right, good. We'll be looking forward to that, Corey. We also have Do You Know? Yes, and here's the situation. The temple has been finished, and Solomon wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant to the temple. So here's what I want to know. Do you know what month the people of Israel gathered together at a feast to bring the Ark? into the temple. <laughs> Corey's having various, Corey has to answer this question later. She had various <laughs> reactions over here in the corner. Uh, it's a good question, a timing question. Stay with us as we continue. And in a moment, we'll talk about powering up the temple and the spirit of God and the power and agreement. But first, here's Corey with Bible Archaeology. Kings chapter 9 verse 26 we are told that Solomon built a fleet of ships at Etzion Geber so there is naturally going to be a port here now there are some historians and archaeologists that believe they have found the site of this very Etzion Geber seaport take a look Nestled in amongst King Solomon's very long list of accomplishments is a fleet of ships on the Red Sea constructed with his close ally, Hiram, King of Tyre. First Kings chapter 9 records how they worked together to build a fleet of merchant ships at Etzion Gever near Eilat on the shore of the Red Sea. From Etzion Gever, they would send ships to Ophir to acquire the famed gold of Ophir exotic woods and precious gems, and ships to Tarshish that would bring back gold, silver, ivory, and exotic animals. The modern-day identities of Tarshish and Ophir have proven puzzling, but due to an 8th century BC inscription that refers to the gold of Ophir, that they existed is no longer questioned. In the past, historians and respected archaeologists have tried to identify the remains of Etzion Gever. This port city would be somewhere on the Red Sea, the modern Gulf of Eilat and Aqaba. The answer to this ancient mystery may lie in what is now the only natural anchorage in the northern Gulf. The modern day ports are completely man made. Just seven miles south of modern Eilat is a small island known as Jazirat Faroon, meaning Pharaoh's Island. 
across its surface, there are medieval ruins and the remains of a man-made small harbor that is now mostly filled in with silt. The island is only 900 feet away from the mainland, which forms a large natural anchorage, a natural safe harbor. Paired with the remains of an ancient seawall that went around the entire perimeter of the island, complete with defensive towers that stretched out into the smaller man-made harbor, and Jazirat Faroon begins to look like an interesting option for the home of the fleets of Solomon. It's time to explore the wise guys of the Bible as we go through the historical books of the kings. And they're all around us. You see it as a wise guy who recognizes and respects the presence of God. From the time of Moses, the Ark of the Covenant was just that, a symbol of God's covenant with his people. 1 Kings chapter 8 brings us front row to the scene in which this ark would be moved again from the city of David on the south side of the city to the temple on the east side of the city. Now there are significant concerns to make sure the posture of the people is proper for the presence of God. Sacrifices are being made continually as the ark passes by the people and moved to the Holy of Holies, the special place. This posture is very wise. Let's study. First Kings 8, 1 through 11. Now Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel, to King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the city of David, which is Zion. Therefore all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. So all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the Ark. Then they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tabernacle of meeting, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle. The priests and the Levites brought them up. Also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for multitude. Then the priests brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place, into the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place, under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their two wings over the place of the Ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the Ark and its poles. The poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary but they could not be seen from outside, and they are there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass, when the priests came out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. I call this one powering up the temple. The temple's been built and all of the various instructions have been laid into place and now Solomon David's son, the third king of Israel, is going to bring the Ark of the Covenant from the city of David, from the tent, the little tent tabernacle, into the temple. And Solomon, if you can pardon the pun, thinks outside the box. This is wise. This is one of the moments in his life when he was really wise. The one where he kept multiplying wives, that wasn't wise. Uh, but this is a wise moment. He builds an event 
and he builds it carefully of moving that Ark of the Covenant into the temple. Now we're going to read about this in 1 Kings chapter 8, and we have found three powerful points here. Study, wise, wisdom, power points. Let's begin by taking a look at 1 Kings chapter 8, beginning with verse 1. We'll read it again. We've already read it. Janice has read it. And it says, Now Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribe, the chief fathers of the children of Israel. So we got all the representation there. Uh, to King Solomon in Jerusalem, from all over the place to Jerusalem, that they might bring the Ark of the Covenant, the Bereth, the Covenant of the Lord, Jehovah that is, from the city of David to Zion. Therefore, all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Athenium, which is the seventh month. Now, our first study-wise point is amazing, and it's also echoed by Jesus in the New Testament. Beloved, there is power in agreement among God's people. God's gatherings are important because we can do together what we cannot do apart. This is very important, and this is the reason why we meet at church. Most of us meet in church on the first day of the week, which on the Julian calendar traditionally has been Sunday. Shabbat begins at uh, Friday night, if you're on the Julian calendar, uh, and then goes through Saturday. And I celebrate Shabbat, and then I also celebrate the first day of the week, which is celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so here in this time, the church is together, and when the church is together, we can pray for the world and Pray for missionaries and we can agree together. Jesus said to his disciples, where two or three are gathered in my name, I, my presence, will be in the midst of them. Now, this is Matthew chapter 18. He also said, you know, wherever there is two or three and you ask in my name, my Father in heaven will do it for you. So there's power in agreement. And Solomon demonstrates this principle right here in 1 Kings chapter 8. It's amazing. Now what the devil's going to try to do, you see, beloved, what he's going to try to do is tell us we don't need church. We don't need each other. All we need is our little, our little televangelist on the TV set. And all we need is to just do that and never even bother going to church anymore. This is not right. This is not right. The Hebrews tells us, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Hebrews 13, 1 says, he says, let brotherly love continue. Be a family. How can you be a family if you're never together? And so here we see this principle in 1 Kings. Let's go on to verse 3. It says, so all the elders of Israel came and the priests took up the ark and they brought the ark of the Lord, that is Jehovah, to the tabernacle uh, or the, the Ark of the Lord of the Tabernacle of Meeting, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle, the priest and the Levites, it's a good thing they did it because David tried to do it another way. Solomon got smart too. And they brought them up. Also the King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled there were with him before the Ark, sacrificing sheep and offerings of oxen so much that it could not be counted for the number of the multitude. Now listen. There is power in honoring God with sacrificial offerings and tithes. It creates an atmosphere of covenant with God. And so, yes, tithes and offerings should go to the storehouse wherever you receive biblical teaching, wherever you receive biblical um, encouragement. And the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's where your tithes and your offerings should go. Make sure it's a pure altar, that it's a gospel teaching, uh, believing church, Bible believing church is very important. But notice here that Solomon is honoring God. And as this ark goes in, there's this great honor going on as well. Verse uh, 10 of uh, chapter 8 says, And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place, watch now, watch this, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest couldn't even minister because the cloud of God's glory was there. God's glory filled the house of the Lord. And beloved, I would leave you with this. There is power in honoring God's covenant. It brings his life-changing presence to our lives. There is a great benefit. I want to use the last few minutes of this telecast to warn you and to encourage you. I would like to warn you that the devil, beloved, is trying to separate us. He's trying to get us set apart. He's trying to get us with our audio fix on our iPods and with our video fix on our telephones. He wants us to text ourselves to death. He wants us to be separate. 
And so what we do at Good Friends on, uh, on, in our prayer meeting on Sunday night, and it makes some guys uncomfortable, you know. Some guys get uncomfortable with this. But as we close out the service, you know, we've got about 100 people at the prayer meeting. As we close out the service, we form a big circle so we can see each other. And I say, let's all hold hands. And some of the, some of the guys are like, I'm not sure about holding hands. The burly guy, I'm not sure about holding hands. And, but uh, come on, let's show. This is a symbol of unity. This is what they did in the early church when they went out of Philippi to find a place to pray. And the centurions saw this and were moved and touched in their heart because there are all these different kinds of people and they were all coming together uh, in unity. And we pray. And, and I want to encourage you now. I want to warn you against isolating yourself from a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, gospel-teaching church. Don't do that. See, our ministry, Quick Study, is different. We want you to take the Bible and what you've learned and take it back to a church and become part of that church. We still want you to watch the program to learn every day, but we want you to also build up your church, the Bible-believing, gospel-teaching church. This is what we want you to do. So I warn you, don't separate yourself. And I encourage you, get into that church, not to get something, but to give something. Go there to worship God, not to see what you can get, but to see what you can give. Think it over. Kings chapter 9 verse 15 we are told of three very important cities that Solomon fortified. Now the main area of a fortification was the gate of the city. Take a look at this. 1st Kings 9 verse 15 says this is the account of the forced labor that King Solomon had imposed to build the Lord's temple, his own palace, the supporting terraces, the wall of Jerusalem, and Hatsor, Megiddo, and Gezer. King Solomon built up the United Kingdom of Israel in many ways, but here the Bible records three strategic cities that were fortified and renovated, Hatsor, Megiddo, and Gezer. All three of these ancient cities have been extensively excavated, and what has been found has caused a scholarly war. At all three of these cities, identical gates have been found from the same time period. They each have the same dimensions, directional orientation, have six chambers, and connect to a casemate wall, which is a specific type of ancient wall. At Hatsor and Megiddo, large building complexes were also identified, as well as palaces at Megiddo and possible storerooms or stables at each site that would have been renovated by later kings. Though strongly and hotly debated, all of these features, especially the six-chambered gates and casemate walls, have been dated to the 10th century BC, right during Solomon's reign. Due to the fact that these cities are spread between what would become known as two separate kingdoms, northern Israel and southern Judah, it's only reasonable to attribute their construction to David or Solomon. Before David, the kingdom of Israel wasn't safely united, and after Solomon, the kingdom split into two. These gates have stood for thousands of years as representatives of an organized, united monarchy that was fortifying the country. The Bible gives us the name of that monarch and specifically identifies these three cities. The king was Solomon. The time was 970 BC. The Bible is full of people who gained insight and instruction from God through dreams and vision. Does it still happen today? A pagan king named Abimelech was warned in a dream not to touch Abraham's wife. Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan Babylonian king, was given a vision of God's future for planet Earth. Join Rod, Janice, and Corey in a special one-hour DVD on biblical dreams and visions. We also ask the question, does it still happen today? 
This special Bible Investigators DVD training video also makes a great topic for small group Bible studies. For your DVD copy of Dreams and Visions on Bible Investigators, send $25 or more to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also order online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Now, Corey, I think we should make a game about this particular segment. You know, you have Bibleopoly, Settlers of Cain, and you have all these games. Well, mm -hmm. we need to have our own game uh, <laughs> called Do You Know or something like that. We need mm -hmm. to come up with well, something. Well, we've had you. a lot of suggestions with that, but it's, um, well, anyway. We'll, we'll see. Let's get to this question. I'm something um, up my sleep. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Hmm. Go ahead. Do You Know. <laughs> right. Well, the temple has been built. Solomon wants to transport the Ark of the Covenant to put it in the temple. So here's the question for today. Do you know what month the people of Israel gathered together at a feast <laughs> to bring the Ark into the temple? Now I'm seeing a lot of activity <laughs> what? in my peripheral vision over oh, here. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see some signs being given back and forth. So there's a few different answers that I will accept. I'll accept the number of the month. I will accept there's two different names that you could give that I would accept. Okay, Corey, what do you think? <laughs> well, you just helped me out a lot by giving me the answer, which is, you know what? Sometimes this is a team effort, Mom, so I think right. that was perfectly fair. Uh, yes, so it is. So our mm -hmm. answer together mm -hmm. is month number seven. Month number seven, I will accept that for sure. Very good. Yeah, <laughs> Very good. Well, do you, great job. Do you happen to know <laughs> what that name was called back, this was before the exile? Um, it was Ethanim. Ethanim? Ethanim. Ethanim. Oh, very and good. And then renamed. Hold on. You can do it. Starts with a T. Tisra. Tishri. Tishri. Yes. <laughs> yes. After the exile. Correct. Yes. And so, let's see. The Ethanim, uh, the definition of that is the month of gifts, for example, of vintage offerings. It's called Tishri after the exile corresponding to part of September and October in our calendar year. It was the first month of the civil year and the seventh of the sacred year. That's right. There was a, there was a religious year and mm -hmm. a civil year. That's right. And the first month of the uh, the the first month of the religious year and the seventh month of the civil year, that becomes important. Opposite. By the way. Or, excuse yeah. me. First month of the civil. Yes, that's seventh of the of sacred. The, thank you. Uh, and that becomes important when you look at the months that Noah gets off the ark. Okay, and that's a hint of Genesis six. Anyway, very good, Corey. Good job. Good job. Good job. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks, good job. Dad. Good job mm -hmm. for you. <laughs> <laughs> we're together, man. We're a team. Mm -hmm. We're a team. We, we can do it. And we're a team, you and I and us, and uh, we want you to continue to go through the Bible with us as we learn the wisdom of God going along that way. Now, we're going to continue doing that, but I want to mention a couple of things to you. First of all, a lot of people ask me the question, they see the program and they wonder, well, what are you talking about with this Quick Study Pocket Guide? And, and what is that? So what is it, Janice? The Quick the Study quick Pocket study Guide, what it, is that? Well, it's a print companion to what we do here on the program. It's not, it doesn't include everything, but it gives you a great outline um, and teaching points. It's, it's wonderful to have, and it gives Bible you commentary. your reading. Yeah, it gives you your reading assignments so that when you come and watch the program every day, you have actually already read the sections um, in your Bible, and then you can learn along with us. And there is a device called a Quick Study Key. And on the Quick Study Key, we actually have the Quick Study programs for that month. And if you have subscribed to the Quick Study Key, which is $10 a month above and beyond your regular giving to cover the cost of it, you get the whole deal right there. It's a little USB drive, 8 gig, and you put it in your computer or your smart TV, and there are the programs along with your Quick Study mm -hmm. Pocket Guide. So if you'd like to know more about this and want to find out more, here's the address. It's P.O. Box 150. Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In fact, there's the guide for January right there on the screen. Uh, we have, we'll end up with 12 guides this year, one for every single month. Uh, the phone number is 724-733-8336. Give us a call if you want to know more information in Canada and the rest of the world, PO Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario. L9W5G2. Also, remember, 519-940-8338. You know, I've got, we've committed to making a time of prayer verbally, Janice, and we've mm -hmm. got um, Effie here from 
we won't name the city, but in the great state of Pennsylvania. And she is asking about something that we are getting a lot of letters on. And so I want to pray. Here's what she writes. Would you please pray for my children's salvation? Now, beloved, this is something that God wants. This is God's will. Mm -hmm. He is not willing that any perish. So we pray in Jesus' name for Effie and all of those, Lord, who are in this situation, mm -hmm. that, they would, that you would be able to take the blinder, you're able, Lord, but take the blinders off the eyes of the children that they might confront the divine reality of Jesus Christ and come into the kingdom. We bless you to receive that, Effie, mm -hmm. in Jesus' name, amen. In the astonishing scene broadcast through time to us from 1 Kings 8, it brings shocking and sobering realities about God's blessing. Three conditions are required for God's presence to be brought into and to bear upon the temple dedication. Number one, the gathering of God's assembly. Number two, the honor of God's covenants through obedience in moving the ark by the Levites. And number three, offerings to God made with humility. God's wisdom is at work in us when we practice these three principles in our daily lives. With that in mind, we pray, Lord, remind me to be a part of your faithful church, to honor your covenants, and to give offerings of love through tithes and offerings. Thanks for joining us today on Quick Study. Before we leave, we continue our commitment to go through the book of Proverbs as well as the whole Bible. So here's Proverbs chapter 12, verses 26 to 28. One of the lines says, In the way of righteousness is life, and in its pathway there is no death. Well, what does that mean, righteousness? Well, the word righteousness actually comes from this idea of being right with God. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It means you're right with God. Well, how can you possibly be right with God? Some people try to say to me, well, Rod, I want to give you an offering because I want to get on the good side of God. But every side of God is good. Uh, you become righteous by saying, Lord, I, I need your help. I don't need to give this or give that offering or, I, or try to get myself into something where I have to serve a certain amount of time. Make a decision and come to Jesus Christ and he'll do the rest. You walk towards him and he'll walk to you and he'll grab you. Just pray and say, Lord, I believe in Jesus Christ. You are the Lord and the Savior of my life. And I ask you to come into my heart, forgive me of my sin, and help me today. Now, if you pray that and mean it, God will change you. You'll see. Train yourself in the basics of biblical archaeology at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Brought to you by Bible Discovery Seminary and Phoenix University of Theology. To find out more, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on Bible Discovery Seminary.